Welcome back, CSI 2021ers. This will be our final discussion about assembly as its own entity. Subsequently, we're going to move on to do an exam and wrap up our discussion of assembly before moving into discussion of proper architecture. In terms of the logistics for the course at the moment, our topics today are mentioned over here. We're briefly going to skate through discussion of data in assembly, uh, talk a little bit about the security issues associated with pointers, especially at the assembly level. Now that we understand how the function call stack works, we're in a position to comment, at least historically, on some vulnerabilities that are present there. And then we'll touch also briefly on how floating point numbers look at the assembly level. It's the case that we have a few important events coming up in terms of the course schedule, and you'll want to keep the following in mind, that we're at Friday the 20th of March right now. This is 2020, if uh, you're listening in the future at some point. But for the course running at the moment, uh, we'll have our prax exam on Monday. This will take place on Gradescope and look very much like an extended version of the lab worksheet that you guys completed on, uh, on Wednesday of this week. On Tuesday, the due date uh, for Project 3 is going to happen. So by the middle of the uh, evening, 11.59 p.m., you'll want to have done both the clock assembly and the binary bomb. Uh, uh, we'll still accept late submissions for a couple days after that at the expense of uh, the engagement points. But then you also want to be having that finished to be prepared for exam two, which is going to take place on Wednesday the 25th. We will have some more details about exactly how we're going to administer the practice exam and the actual exam uh, coming up soon. For the moment, before we get into some of those additional details associated with assembly language stuff, I just want to take a moment to reflect uh, that our model of what goes on inside of a computer was somewhat simplified before. And what you see down at the bottom of this slide is a reiteration of something that showed up on our first week of lecture in terms of the memory model we laid out for how things work according to functions, according to pointers between various spots in memory. And we've now discovered, if you think about it with even a little bit of uh, diligence, uh, that much of what is present here is actually wrong. That dropping down to the x86 assembly level has illustrated a number of fallacies uh, with the model that was laid out here. Certainly what's present was useful because it explained how C programs work, but it isn't actually how a proper real x86 system works. So if you wouldn't mind, take just a moment to reflect on exactly how it is that this picture that we've drawn with pointers between things uh, over here uh, is incorrect and how the hand waviness that we had before about as one function like main runs, it somehow remembers where a line number is to execute so that when another function like swap finishes, uh, where is it that, or how is it that main gets control back on that? And finally, there are a bunch of things in the stack here, uh, local variables in particular, and we've learned more recently that the stack itself doesn't always control, uh, contain all of the local variables, that there are a few other spots that folks, uh, in particular the compiler, can place uh, variables. And it's important then to understand how a function like swap might actually appear at the assembly level. So take a moment, reflect on those things, and mentally call to mind those things that are wrong. I'll take just a breath here, allow you to pause if you're so inclined. And then we'll move on to discuss together uh, some of the obvious fallacies that I think are most important to underscore. So if you've thought long and hard or you're just skipping ahead uh, to the answers on this front, they show up in the next slide and they're roughly as follows. First, uh, the main function must have some stack space uh, for locals that it's going to make use of. So it's very likely to contain some spots in main memory on the function call stack uh, for X and Y up here. In contrast, though, uh, the swap function itself uh, 
doesn't need addresses for anything. It's handed addresses for other stuff, but it's very unlikely that it will have anything in the stack space associated with it because the register file is this other spot we've talked about data being stored. Uh, and the arguments that are coming into it will probably be passed in the argument registers, uh, as well as if there's any need for locals down here, uh, such as temp, uh, then one could easily use a register for that instead. Uh, so that also sort of, sort of underscores this fallacy that not every variable that you'd see in a program uh, actually shows up as stack space. Instead, the modern CPU as a register machine is divided between main memory, which has a function call stack, where some things that need a main memory address might exist. Uh, on the other hand, the register file is used for a lot of stuff there. This fallacy of functions keeping track of what line number they're at uh, was sort of only mildly false uh, that instead uh, the control mechanism we talked about for functions to pass control to and from each other relies on the special register, the RIP, uh, and that contains some address in memory for assembly instructions uh, to be issued. And despite not having any local space for things like A, B, and temp in it, swap must certainly have uh, an old instruction pointer value, uh, which pertains to main, and the actual value for that is probably like whatever the bytecode address for line 13, this printf call is, or it's setup. Uh, that's probably present in the stack which allows when swap issues its return assembly instruction uh, it to get back up to main to the right instruction up here. Uh, so to that end, there were a number of things wrong with these previous pictures. They were simplified and those days uh, were nice because uh, the simplified understanding you get from pictures like this uh, belies a lot of the complexity under the hood of how it's actually affected in a register machine. Uh, but it's worthwhile uh, just to dwell on that uh, for a moment and uh, sort of understand that you've gone a considerable distance if you now can talk about things like arguments being passed through registers, uh, the instruction pointer in its place, the stack and the stack pointer and how things are manipulated up here, but not necessarily so if they can be stored in registers. Uh, so then there are probably a few other things that are wrong with that old model, uh, but those I feel are the most important uh, to point out at this time. So let us talk then for a moment about the way that data shows up in assembly. If you've been working on the project with some diligence, then a lot of this is probably already apparent. It builds on the model we had earlier of how data lays out in C programs. In particular, if you have more than one value in sequence in an array, uh, all of the items in that array are contiguous. They're packed tightly together and they all have the same size. And this is why in C, you see this uh, square brace notation uh, used to denote a sort of kind of diff reference to, uh, which is at the low level, to go wherever the array starts and then to go to some offset it uh, from the beginning of that array, uh, which is dictated by the value of the index uh, i multiplied by however big the elements are. And so a C level uh, bit of code that looks like this, where I'm assigning 12 to some element of the array, was probably going to be translated to x86-64 assembly into an instruction that looks kind of like this, where I'm going to move 12 as the source to some destination that's in main memory. And you'll know it's in main memory here by this indirect uh, set of uh, parentheses here that indicates treat some of these registers as pointers. In this case, RDI will be that pointer. RSI takes the uh, position of the index uh, for this array. So it's very likely that if you were seeing in some loop uh, some i variable getting incremented, then in this translation RSI would be that uh, variable. It's used as the index. And since this is likely an array of integers, uh, then I'd use size 4 here uh, to indicate and multiply 4 times RSI plus whatever the starting point of the array is. That's where in main memory uh, to put 12. This is in part why C has this construct, because it reflects very common operations that happen at the assembly level and vice versa on that front. Uh, if you go in the other direction, for instance, extracting an element from an array, uh, in that case, uh, then the source would be the main memory location, RDI the start of the array, RCX probably correspond to the variable J, again, size four elements indicating 32-bit integers or something like it, and then this R8D probably being the X uh, variable uh, that is, uh, the main memory is being moved into. Uh, 
Uh, so the compiler would automatically detect this is an array of integers or this is an array of longs, uh, and it would load up an address for that array start some in some register, and then manage uh, also uh, through the type system to determine how big each of the elements are, uh, ints being four, characters being one, and so on, and then pick an appropriate constant over here to multiply indices by in order to do the array offset calculation. Structs are similar in some ways in that they are also fairly tightly packed contiguous uh, chunks of data. The big difference being that the size of these is not uh, uniform as it is in arrays, that each of the things in this little foo t has a different size. Uh, the integer it, that starts it out has a size four, the short two bytes, and the character array that shows up each of those elements is too big. But we've already seen then that there are assembly level mechanisms just to account for offsets that are sort of like this. Uh, for example, uh, down here, uh, this move w of four away from RDI, this is what you would expect to see for some sort of translation of an axis of this S field uh, within this uh, uh, struct uh, that I'll call F here. F in this case is uh, referenced by a pointer uh, and the F arrow here is a dereference. So F must point someplace in main memory and I want to extract the S field. The compiler calculates using some algorithm where exactly it's going to lay out each of these fields. And according to this translation, it's very likely that these are packed tightly together. So the first four bytes are the integer i, the next two bytes at offset four are the short s, and the next two bytes at offset six uh, comprise the character array c2. Uh, so this would extract the S field uh, from main memory and plop it down in this register SI. Note the move W there, which will only touch two bytes, that's important for the short here, and the target uh, destination register SI being the 16-bit name for that uh, SI family register. Uh, if you wanted instead to translate some C code that looks like this, where you have both a dereference of this F uh, pointer, which is one of these foo T structs, and then a dereference uh, from wherever the array in it uh, started uh, to assign to that uh, X, you would probably see something along the following lines show up in assembly. Uh, I'm moving a single byte in this case because characters are a single byte big. Uh, the choice of 88 here probably corresponds to the ASCII code for the character X. And then this little bit of nonsense here uh, can be interpreted as follows. RDI is the pointer F that was synonymous uh, or in line with what we determined earlier that RDI up here is uh, pointing where F is. The six offset that shows up over here is to state that this character array starts six bytes off from the start to where this points. And finally then, I'll presume that RAX, that's probably the index uh, I in this case, uh, which is going to get me somewhere into the middle of that array so that I can place it. Uh, there are probably a few other options uh, for something like this, uh, but this is a compact way to do it that alleviates the need to load first the address of C and then do a second load uh, or store in order to access it. Uh, the compiler would select an instruction like this because it gets both those things done in one fell swoop. Uh, but it's an interesting sort of combination of elements of here's an instance of that somewhat rare to uh, address form where this is a starting address and this is an offset and then I have an additional offset to add on to it. Uh, so at any rate, the data that you have seen in C can be translated fairly readily into uh, constructs that show up in assembly language. And to some extent, C was invented after assembly so reflects the capabilities of common assembly instruction sets. There are a couple notes uh, that are worth mentioning that it's not always the case that you have structs stored in um, main memory uh, through pointers. That instead, you'll sometimes see structs stored uh, readily in stack space, uh, but also potentially stored entirely in registers. One common place that you'll see this is if you are translating some C code, uh, such as uh, what you see down here around line 12, where you're passing a whole struct in as an argument to a function. Uh, that struct is laid out here in uh, the, uh, the source code as being on the stack. Uh, 
but rather than pass a pointer to it through an address, uh, the struct is sort of copied uh, as the first argument uh, to this, um, uh, to the, as an argument to this function substructs. Now, if you looked at the assembly code associated with this uh, substruct um, function, uh, what you'd see is sort of an interesting array of different operations that are used uh, to accomplish the following. That this function, as taking a single argument, means the entire uh, entirety of the struct is going to be passed in the first argument register, uh, RDI in this case. The bit layout of this struct is fairly simple, and that's the first thing you show up in the struct is called first, and the second show up uh, is called second. Each of those is 16 bits long. But the way the compiler typically translates this is uh, into a so-called uh, packed struct argument, where all, both those things are present in RDI. Uh, and it'll be the case that the first thing, uh, this field first, that shows up in the low order bits, uh, 0 to 15. Uh, and the second thing shows up later on or at higher bits uh, in RDI. Uh, that shows up here in bits uh, 16 to 32, although this should be 31, because huh, that'll be a total of 16 bits for it. I'll make a correction later for that, but you catch my drift. Now that means since the register RDA contains two things of interest, you'll have to go through a little bit of rigmarole in order to extract and use them separately. The typical sequence that you'd see is something like the following. Uh, you'd copy EDI into EAX. So this takes uh, both the 0 to 15 and 16 to 32, both these fields ts.first uh, and ts.second, uh, and copies it into EAX. So this is sort of equivalent to setting EAX to the whole struct as it appears in EDI. Uh, it's questionable why one would want to do that until you look at the next instruction, which is going to mask. It uses an AND operation, and it uses a series of 16 ones, that's the FFF here. Those are in the low order bits, 0 to 15. And then what shows up to the left of it, uh, which is implicitly zeros, that's going to be used to eliminate any one bits that show up in the rest of the register. So by doing this AND, I restrict uh, EAX to have only its bits 0 to 15 set. That if any ones in there, they live, but any ones above it, which would be associated with this second field, uh, they get nullified. And so that leaves EAX holding only this first field. Same basic pattern is used. Uh, this time I'm going to use EDI directly. Uh, and try and set it up so EDI contains this field second, but only uh, the field second. Uh, so I'd shift that right, and in a lot of cases that's all I'd need because that would shift z bits 0 to 15 off to the right, and bits uh, 16 to 31, they will shift into position 0 to 15. But for, just for good measure, in case the rest of the register uh, EDI hadn't been initialized, I'll do an AND again with low 16 bits to ensure that only those low 16 bits uh, are initialized. At that point, I have in register EAX uh, the ts.first field, and in EDI the ts.second field. It's very likely that in your project 3, as you'd be writing the second function in the project, you'll be taking a packed struct argument of some kind and need to extract the individual fields of it. Uh, that might correspond to uh, hours and minutes and seconds, or in other settings, uh, things like some degrees or some scale uh, or some battery meter or something like that. Uh, but you'll have to take those bits uh, and extract and and them uh, by through a shift, uh, a series of shifts and ands like that to get the individual values into registers before you start committing to performing the logic of the rest of the function. So keep that in mind. This is a trick then that the compiler used uses uh, so that there's no need to reference main memory in the assembly code that's uh, generated. Uh, and it's the case then that the calling sequence for this substructs function, it obeys the standard uh, C and assembly conventions that here in the C level, it takes a single argument. And here at the assembly level, it again takes a single argument. Uh, now this raises an interesting question of, of what if my struct is really, really big, and this does happen from time to time, that you'd have a struct that is larger than 64 bits. Uh, so you one could easily arrange for that uh, instead of two shorts here. If I had two fields that were a long and a long, that's 64 bits a piece. The compiler knows about this, and so if you were trying to pass a very large struct like that, it would split the fields as efficiently as possible across multiple argument registers as you're passing in uh, the struct itself. But again, uh, that's something that's best left to the compiler to take care of. 
and any time you would not be passing in a struct itself, but were to put an ampersand here, then you're always just passing a 64-bit address to the struct in main memory instead. And the access sequence to get the stuff uh, in there looks more like what we have up here, that if I have a pointer to a struct instead, then you'll be moving things out of main memory using indirects here, versus when you have the struct itself, then it'll probably be a series of shifts and ands. So a couple cautions, uh, just as you would be dealing with structs uh, at the assembly level. Uh, and it's more or less the, uh, uh, the, the caution is don't try to deal with them at the assembly level unless you really, really have to. Uh, the compiler will honor the ordering of these fields in a struct uh, according to how they show up in source code. Uh, so it's the case that if you have a, f a struct that looks like this with a first and a second field, then always earlier in memory or earlier in bits, uh, the first field will occur. And then later in memory or later in bits, uh, the second field will occur. However, the compiler does take some liberties uh, to add things into this, uh, the structs uh, in terms of padding. So if you had, for instance, this first field as a character, it's fairly likely that the compiler would not uh, have a one byte character followed immediately by a two byte short that instead it'd probably leave a little space after the character so that this is aligned at a 16 bit boundary. This notion of padding then is something that varies somewhat from compiler to compiler and the layout algorithms that are used between compilers vary somewhat. They even vary somewhat from one version of a compiler to the next. Uh, so to that end, you sh are best off uh, trying to use the compiler rather than deal with this at the assembly level. Uh, and if you really need to dig in, then you may have to look at some automatically generated assembly code that the compiler kicks out in order to see what its conventions are for a particular struct layout. Uh, to that end then, your best bet then is to stay insulated and feel the warmth that's provided by tools like compilers as an abstraction over the lower level world that all of you no doubt have grown to hate at this point. Uh, all right, so let us uh, move ahead and talk about another topic that is of some import, although maybe less so uh, at, at this point in terms of uh, security. We have seen that in the sort of understanding of assembly, one of the important things that gets put into the stack is uh, the return address for a function. And this is historically has been a major target for a series of security flaws known generally as buffer overflow attacks. Uh, we've seen from early on that C doesn't do much in the way of safety. It favors performance and access to the machine over trying to prevent programmers from making errors uh, or introducing flaws in their programs. And one of the things that historically has proven difficult before folks in the C world at least really began to understand the risks associated with certain functions is code that looks sort of like this. That you would have a function uh, and that function would need to read some sort of data that's string-like that was going to be entered by the user, uh, perhaps through a file or by, through typing or something like that. Uh, and the programmer responsible for writing a routine like this would allocate on the stack some fixed size buffer, uh, in this case 1,024 characters, because really, who has a name that's longer than 1,024 characters? It's unlikely that anyone actually does, and I sort of pity the person that would have such a long name, but this became a potential target for folks who wanted to circumvent this program. In particular, hackers who would be interacting with this program if it were online could feed it more data than was typically expected. Uh, and so if they input a string that was, instead of the limit 1024, 1500 characters long, it's questionable sort of what happens. Now we've talked about the behavior of functions like fscanf uh, or an equivalent get s, uh, which is a string function that just reads input from the user uh, that's typed and places it in this buff. The typical approach to those things is just to plop down characters until there's some sigil that indicates the end. And if the end comes well after the end of the buffer, then you write into the 1024, 1025th, 1026 characters. This uh, proves problematic because 
uh, it's, there are other things stored tightly in the stack at that point. Other variables that need to be in main memory, and in particular, the, uh, the return address for the function uh, is present in main memory. Uh, and so to that end, an entrepreneuring hacker can try to orient and figure out, I see that this buffer is 1,024 characters long, and so I'm going to enter at least 1,024 characters. And after some experimentation, I see that, oh, there's actually a couple other variables on here. Uh, and so if I enter 1,032 characters, anything I after enter after that becomes characters that are written to the location in memory where the return address appears. Uh, this is very risky because by overwriting the return address, by the end of the function, all the ret instruction does in assembly is pick up whatever is at the top of the stack and jump to the CPU to start executing instructions there by setting the rip to it. If that rip is uh, sort of overwritten by something that a hacker wants, they can start getting code that wasn't necessarily supposed to be there to execute. Now, you shouldn't fret too much. Uh, first, if you're in a position to write code like this, then probably you'll have an employer that uh, forces you to go through some security training to say that this is really, really unsafe code to write, that you never in security situations would write some code that reads an arbitrary number of characters from some spot uh, uns in an unsafe fashion like this, that there are alternatives uh, to scanf that would read uh, a limited number of characters so that you could fill things into this buffer and if you decided, oh, I still need some more, then you go into some sort of loop where you malloc more space for it and never overwrite anything. Second, you should know that due to security flaws like this, which have caused a lot, a lot of trouble as the internet started to grow up, uh, the operating system itself and GCC have collaborated in order to install a number of protection measures. Uh, the stack protection uh, measures that are present in GCC uh, generally follow uh, the following flavor, that when a function starts, uh, the compiler has inserted some instructions to both copy some data and shift the stack around just a little bit uh, to place these canary values in there. Canary there is a reference to canary's use in uh, mines. Like back in the old days before modern detection technology, miners way down uh, deep underground would bring canaries along with them. And canaries being small, if there was some poisonous gas that was seeping into the mine that would eventually kill the miners, the canary, being small, would die very quickly first, and the miners would know that something is up. So in this case, those canary values, they get pay placed in the stack, uh, and if someone overwrites a buffer like this, chances are likely that they'll change one of the canary values. Before a function returns, uh, this return instruction uh, will examine, to some extent, those canary values to ensure that they are still what the expected values ought to be. And if anything has changed, and then you get a so-called stack smashing error uh, that a number of you seen. We'll see that in just a second. Um, so uh, to that end, it's uh, probably likely that even if you wrote code like this, if you compiled with modern GCC, uh, then you wouldn't encounter too much trouble because attempts to override the buffer would smash the stack, uh, causing your program to end prematurely with an error report. The other major thing that the compiler and the operating system tend to do is to randomize the address of stuff. We'll have a look at that in just a second as well as we attempt to execute and fail to do so uh, these buffer overflow attacks. Uh, this is enabled through a combination of the virtual memory system and then a specific use of uh, assembly level instructions to enable code in modern programs to be executed starting from any address that they want. Uh, now these protections that are mentioned up here, which we'll experience in a little bit more detail momentarily, uh, they can be disabled by passing the right set of options to GCC, but do so at your own peril. Uh, those are meant to protect you and your programs from being abused. And so unless you have a really good reason uh, to do so, probably just compile with the default options and you'll get some of the protections enabled by GCC and the operating system. We're going to look for a moment at the following code, uh, which I think I have a kind of version of it here. We're going to make a couple observations about it. The intent of this program is to demonstrate what used to suffice in order to affect this buffer overflow attack. You see a function up here called never, and as per its name, you'll not see it down here printed anyplace uh, or called. 
used to be the case that you could actually get this function to run if you gave this program the right input. Uh, to understand why, I'll bypass this uni up here. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and instead, just look at uh, the input loop down here, which uh, has a print to prompts for a string, a very tiny buffer, uh, pitifully small, and then an f scanf. And this is exactly the kind of code that a moment ago we mentioned is dangerous uh, to use. And we're doing it here to try to demonstrate uh, some of the problems associated with this. The idea would be then that since there aren't too many local variables here, an entrepreneuring hacker could guess, okay, if I enter at least four characters, that fills up this buffer. Uh, and then if I start entering more, uh, then I will uh, probably be able to overwrite the return address in some way. I should backtrack just a little bit there because if it's FSK enough, then uh, if I enter three characters, it'll null terminate. So that'll be the four. So I'd want to enter three plus uh, some other stuff. Uh, and to try to figure out what is the address of this never function. And if I can code that as a set of ASCII strings, then it'll be read in using FSCANF. They'll overwrite the return address. Uh, and so whenever FSCANF returns, it'll find its way back up here to never. Uh, so to that end, uh, we're going to find out that this is actually much harder to do in the modern era due to these protections. To give us a fighting chance, uh, the information up here uh, sets up a little union, uh, and it sets the first field of that uh, as a long number uh, to the address of this function never. And that is actually the starting address then of the bytes associated with uh, the text version of never, that's assembly instructions. And this is the first sort of sign that interpreted here, this never word, as bare word, is actually an address. It's the address of the code associated with never. Uh, that's a novel concept, and at a later point in the semester, we may have a little bit of a chance to talk about function pointers. Uh, but that's enough for the moment. Uh, it's also the case then that, um, uh, oh, actually, I'm changing the address here, so that's maybe not the, the best. Oh, no, I'm not. Okay, so it's got nine characters, and I'm null terminating it here. So, and then uh, this string version of it being union will just attempt then to give me a fighting chance to say, here's the address in hexadecimal uh, as a pointer, and here's the address interpreted uh, as a string instead. Uh, although it's, I've not had much luck with actually getting this sort of stuff to work. So uh, to that end, let's just run this program quick. Um, and maybe that'll get you sort of an idea uh, of what's happening here. Uh, so I'm going to GCC this buffer overflow dot C. Uh, let's see, no such file. Okay, I guess I copied it over from something else. Hang on a second. Uh, is this uh, no? Let's see. So I uh, hmm. my slide. Maybe that has it. Hang on a second. Uh, uh, okay, so I got to recreate the, the re recreate the program on here. Buffer overflow dot c. There we go. Okay, cool. So what happens when you get too many um, too many versions of a program as you try and hack it uh, together? So uh, running this program with a little e dot out, uh, you can see up here. The address of this function never is up here. Uh, this is the hexadecimal bytes here interpreted as a string. They look pretty ugly. Uh, if I put a one, two, three in here, uh, and then maybe a four to overwrite, uh, and then this long thing right here, that's sort of gibberishy. In the past, this, or maybe a few, adding a few other things like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, and a nine to sort of overwrite stuff. Uh, this would uh, potentially get me to overwrite the um, return address uh, at some spot so that when you returned, you would actually jump into that never function. But you can see uh, GCC's got me back here uh, in that this stack smashing thing has been detected and that I've overwritten the buffer and started to mess around with values in the stack. This is detected and rather than continue in an unsafe way, uh, GCC is just bailing out at this point. Uh, and to that end, this is the desirable kind of behavior because uh, if something is detected as wrong, you'd want to quit earlier rather than carrying on the program execution in an unsafe fashion. So a couple other things to mention in this. If you ran this program several times, uh, as in I'll run a dot out, uh, you'll notice an interesting phenomena that uh, comparing up here the address uh, for this function never as 06 
560 or OX560519 and so forth. Uh, you'll see the second time I ran this function, uh, ran this program rather, I get a different address for the function, uh, OX563 instead of 560. Uh, if I just bail out of this thing and run it a third time, you'll see it's moved yet again. This is that second protection mechanism that I mentioned associated with the operating system and the compiler uh, as it uh, produces code, it actually produces it in this position independent fashion. And the operating system, which will load up and start running this program, usually places the uh, functional code at somewhat arbitrary positions. Uh, and so each time you run it, the address that's targeted it actually moves around. Uh, and so this makes it increasingly harder because each time the, a hacker would potentially interact with this, uh, if the program has been restarted, then they'll have a different address that they have to try and guess at. Uh, and this makes it uh, much, much more difficult then uh, to hunt down and eventually get that code to execute. Uh, now this is not cost-free, uh, that randomization thing. It relies upon the virtual memory system, uh, something that we'll talk about in more detail later on in the semester. And it's also why you have to access global variables in assembly using this funky syntax that we'll uh, talk about, this uh, so-called RIP relative addressing mode uh, that we'll discuss again, in, or we'll discuss in just a moment. Um, that's present in the project spec where in order to access global variables, you have to use things like uh, my my int uh, and then uh, an offset from the rip, uh, sort of like that thing. Uh, that enables these protection mechanisms associated with address randomization. Uh, so we'll uh, address that just in just a moment. Um, so on that topic then, uh, right here, uh, the notion of addressing globals in assembly is slightly convoluted you'll have seen from the project spec that you can set up global data in an assembly file using a combination of a couple things. The first is you have to declare that a particular section of assembly code is a data section. And that can be via the dot data directive or a dot section data uh, directive. A couple options there that are supported by the assembler. Uh, but after that, anything that you plop down will be treated just as uh, data rather than text uh, to execute uh, and be fed to the processor. A typical way to do this is to lay down a label for some piece of global data that you want. And this gives you essentially a variable name uh, that's associated with that global data, uh, although it functions somewhat more like the labels associated with code than you might think. And then using a directive like .int, which would allocate four bytes and then plop down the decimal representation uh, in binary of 17 there. If you need an array, then you can lay out a sequence of these. Uh, here's a sequence of shorts. Uh, and so the label sum shorts would roughly correspond at the C level then to an array of three short values with the values 10, 12, and 14 in there. Now the modern mechanism in assembly to access those global variables is something like the following. Uh, you have a move instruction that you're trying to get this global variable and int copied into EAX. Notice the use of movable here because uh, I'm moving a long word, a 32-bit quantity. Uh, that's what I laid out in assembly over here. But I have this slightly obtuse method of accessing it. Uh, anint is used as a symbolic offset from the instruction pointer. This seems extremely strange, uh, but trust me, this is how the compiler by default is going to generate instructions that access global variables along these lines. And it's what the compiler by default and the assembler by default will accept these days in GCC. Uh, similarly, if I wanted to load up the starting address of this sum shorts array, then I'd probably use a leak. Uh, and again, a relative offset from the rip uh, of sum shorts into RDI. The reason I've used a leak here is because uh, the Q corresponds to 64 bits and I'm loading a 64-bit address in this case to be used later in some instructions to access individual elements of this array sum shorts. Uh, to make that apparent, I'll pull up the associated assembly file for this. Uh, in the code pack, there's this globalsgood.s uh, file. And so the first couple lines that are shown over here, uh, they lay out those first two lines we talked about as good in there. Uh, and then subsequently, I do something like uh, zero out the RDX register, move a one into RSI, and then finally use a move W to extract something from that short array up there. 
Uh, I'm using RDI here. Uh, that was what I set up as the starting address for the array. RSI, which I just had a one for, uh, and then a size for the elements in that array of two. So this is gonna access element one, uh, index one of the array. That should be the value 12, and that's loaded into DX, the 16-bit portion of the D family register. After that, I do some addition and then return uh, so that if you ran this code over here, GCC global uh, globals good dot s, uh, and then ran it, it won't appear to do much, uh, but you can echo out the return value for the function or the program a dot out uh, that's coming from this return instruction over here, and you'll see that it's 29. That's the 17 that I loaded up from an int that's here, and index one of the uh, array sum shorts that's here. Add those together uh, to get 29, and that's where the return code for this program is coming from. Now, in contrast to that, historically, one used to be able to directly access global variables in assembly. So you'd see something like a movel and int into EAX, uh, or a leak of just some shorts to say calculate its address and copy it into RDI. Uh, it is the case that with the right options, you can probably get GCC to swallow this. And in some cases, some compilers by default still accept this uh, kind of an invocation. The trouble is that this is no longer relative to RIP, and so is position dependent in some ways. Uh, this will circumvent the security measures uh, that the operating system uh, can make use of, and so is generally disfavored. By default, compiling along these lines will get you errors, uh, and sh the code here that looks as such should be converted over to code that looks like this instead. So if you ever see something about a relocation error in your data section, uh, and that you can't make this a position independent executable object, uh, then it's very likely that you have some references to global variables advertently or inadvertently in there uh, that need to be changed to rip relative addressing. The last bit of discussion that we should mention is to touch a little bit on the floating point side of the assembly level stuff. Now this looks a little different because if you go back to the origins of the AD86 processor, the Intel chip that has evolved into its current sort of behemoth form, you'll find that the original AD86 didn't even have floating point operations supported. Uh, that it had a counterpart, the AD87, which was a separate coprocessor entirely, uh, that Intel would be happy to sell you in addition to your main CPU. And the whole intent of the AD87 was to do floating point computations. Uh, now, modern CPUs have evolved to the point that just the CPU itself is capable of doing floating point computations, although it's usually done in a separate portion of the processor uh, from the typical ALU arithmetic logic units. And since the parts of the assembly language that support uh, floating point operations, uh, they have been added on, they have a somewhat different flavor. It's to some extent more uh, regular in many ways than the traditional 8086 and x86-64 uh, integer sets of operations. So the first things uh, that you would encounter is that in order to do most floating point operations, you have to put values in special registers, uh, sometimes referred to as media registers. Uh, the first sets of these that were introduced uh, were called XMMM, or XMM, uh, that's for the MM there is for multimedia. Uh, those were a whopping 128 bits long, uh, so twice as big as even the 64-bit registers that are present. And yet again, these have been extended uh, in more modern times to include this YMM register. Same area of memory, it's just YMM doubles the size. So XMM would refer to the lower 128 bits, YMM would refer to all 256 bits uh, that are in there. And they're usually in modern x86-64 systems, 16 of these uh, multimedia registers. Uh, to that end, it's sort of stunning like how large of these are, and it shouldn't be confused with extremely large floating point numbers. Instead, these are so-called vector registers, in that they're supposed to hold multiple registers or multiple values that are stacked together bitwise. For example, uh, the ith XMM register uh, could be used to hold two 64 bits, 
uh, quantities uh, in this IEEE uh, double format, or for 32-bit floating point values in the IEEE float or 32-bit format. Uh, so those would be stacked together in one uh, XMM register. So you get either two doubles or four floats in this XMM and double that in the, the YMM. The reason that this is done is that a lot of the floating point operations that are supported are, are intent to be used in a vectorial fashion. Uh, so one could take four or two values in the two registers, XMM2 and XMM4, do a subtraction on them, and would actually subtract them in sequence. Uh, so the zeroth thing in XMM2 would be subtracted from the zeroth thing in XMM4, uh, and the answer to that would be stored in the zeroth XMM there. They're like tiny little arrays in that respect. Uh, you'll notice here the D over here. I believe that is short for double. Uh, so you'd actually be looking here for two double sized, as in bits 0 to 63 are the first double, and 64 to 127, that's the second double. So you have two in XMM2, two in XMM4, you subtract them, and the, they go into XMM0 as the answer. The other thing to note about this uh, sort of operand form is that uh, it actually is a three operand form that you can give a target register, in this case XMM0, uh, to be assigned whatever the answer is of subtracting XMM2 off uh, from XMM4. Uh, and this is somewhat more flexible than what the two operand style associated with traditional 8086 uh, processor instructions looks like. It's actually more reminiscent of your modern RISC architecture. Uh, for instance, if you were to look at ARM or MIPS instructions, different processors with a different assembly language, you'd see many more of these three operand instruction forms. Uh, so at any rate, uh, the idea behind these registers was to support massive floating point computations uh, to do multimedia versus uh, video encoding, uh, which involves a lot of um, floating point computations uh, to facilitate computations for science or for gaming or that kind of stuff. Uh, generally, the modern x86-64 uh, machine is fairly efficient at this stuff if the compiler can generate this kind of instruction for it. But it's, it's still the case that if you were really going to crank numbers hard, you'd probably move to a more dedicated coprocessor like a GPU. And even in, though the modern CPU has both the uh, integer and floating point operations that you'd expect, there's still a want for more performance. So you have dedicated uh, coprocessors just as back in the day there was an 8087. You might get yourself an NVIDIA uh, or uh, I'm forgetting the other one. They're owned by uh, AMD now. Uh, but one of these graphics coprocessors that's whole purpose in the world is to do massively quick uh, floating point computations because most game graphics boil down to a lot of matrix and vector operations uh, in floating point space. The last thing to mention about the floating point side then is the part that connects the integer and the floating point portions of the modern processor. Uh, so since an x86-64 processor has these register file for integers and a separate register file just for floating point stuff, you need some ways to move things in between them. There are certainly some move stores and so forth, but more commonly, if you'd see C code that looks like this, that you have an integer and you want to uh, convert that to a double to do computations with it in floating point, then the compiler would issue some sort of a conversion instruction. Uh, and this involves a combination of both the integer registers and the floating point registers. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the format for this is, but it's something like vector converts uh, a single precision integer to a single double uh, precision value or something like that. Uh, and to that end, this is a several cycle assembly instruction uh, just to do a conversion along these lines. Uh, going the other direction, for instance, pulling out a floating point value, uh, in converting it into an integer or a long, uh, there would be a sequence of assembly instructions to do that, to interconvert between the bit layout for integers uh, and single floating point or 64-bit double floating point uh, values. Uh, this is a non-trivial operation. It's like a five cycle latency. And if you're doing it a lot in tight loops, then you're probably losing out a lot on performance. Uh, doing a single conversion and then staying 
as a floating point value for as long as possible for converting back is the right way to go there. Um, so be aware then uh, that these two parts of the processor are very separate. We aren't going to spend much of any more time discussing floating point operations and their side of it. But if you find yourself in a numerical or scientific computing situation, then you may need to drop down and look at some of the vector level instructions that the CPU is making use of uh, to improve performance. That is a wrap as it comes uh, to our initial foray into assembly. The next steps that we're going to make post-exam are to begin a discussion of computer architecture properly, as in what are the bits and pieces that go into making a CPU. With what we have in hand now in terms of how assembly languages look, uh, and behave for that matter, we'll be in a good position to start understanding from the outside in some of the pieces that go into a CPU uh, to affect the actual processing that you see in modern machines. I'll see you next time.